entrepreneurs who've been very successful, I think it's our responsibility to share what we know, what we've seen, who we know, the support and the encouragement, the tricks to you know getting fear out of the way and to make that next step when it's um, a really dark tunnel. Hello, Profit First entrepreneurs and thought leaders. I am so excited. We have a special guest today. Her name is Genevieve Paturo. And Genevieve is a professional speaker and personal strategy coach that shares life and leadership lessons that she has learned in her own personal journey through the Leadership Within the Pajama program. And she is also a best-selling author that's in the inspiration category. And that book has actually won the National Indie Excellence Book Award. And that book is called Purpose, Passion, and Pajamas, How to Transfer Your Life, Embrace the Human Connection, and Lead with Meaning. She's also a TEDx speaker. Her TEDx talk was related to one idea plus one human connections equals 7 million pajamas and books. Please join me and welcome Jenny to our platform. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm excited to be here with you. Well, we're excited to have you. You know what? I would love to know more. I know we talked offline a little bit. You said a six-year-old asked a question that changed your life, that jumped you into a whole new platform of really discovering yourself and starting this journey of creating this pajama program. Tell me about what the six-year-old's question was that changed your life. Oh, of course. Um, Well, I was climbing the corporate ladder because that was my dream to be like Mary Tyler Moore. And 12 years in, I did have a great life. And one day, single in my apartment, quiet, which never was quiet, I heard a voice in me ask me, if this is the next 30 years of your life, is this enough? And in that second, I realized that it was my life was pretty empty and I'd be alone if I didn't make any changes. It was a real eye opener. And it was a scary moment for me to come face to face with that and to hear that question come from from my heart. And I started to read in shelters because I wanted to bring children into my life. And in these emergency shelters, I'd go at night with storybooks and I'd read. And the children had just come in, been taken from a very difficult situation by police or social workers. And they were in a safe place, but this was the first stop. And so you can imagine they were afraid and, you know, some of them were wearing soiled clothes and, but they were safe. And I would read the stories. And one night when I was there, I followed the staff where they were taking these children to go to sleep. And it broke my heart to see them, you know, two or three huddled onto one surface and wearing the clothes they'd brought, been brought in with. And some of them were crying. And all I could think of was to ask the staff, can I bring some pajamas next week? And they thought that was a lovely idea. And they did. And most of the children took them quietly went into that room and this little girl was so afraid so afraid of me she just kept shaking her head no she didn't want them and I tried to gently nudge her and finally when no one else was there she whispered in my ear what are pajamas and that question just floored me I just couldn't it never occurred to me you know in my little world that there was this little girl who didn't know what pajamas were and how many more of these children were there And that's when my obsession began. That is really neat. I know our viewers are not too familiar with the pajama program. Tell us a little bit about the pajama program and what is that and the significance of it? Sure. Um, It took me uh, quite a journey to say we are 20 years old with more than 7 million pajamas and books um, provided to these children across the U.S. through 63 of our chapters. So I started because of an obsession. And people wanted to help. I was afraid to, to talk about it because I had a job and I didn't know, you know what was going to happen. I didn't have any other income. I didn't know if I should jump off that ladder you know, in, in a day. So I struggled with all of that. But the more I started to open up and share that experience, that little girl's question, and people could feel how upset I was about this. And it was as if they had heard the little girl themselves ask that question when I conveyed that story. So little by little, people wanted to help. And I think such a simple idea, but conveying love and comfort and what these children have a right to at bedtime, to to go to sleep knowing, feeling secure that somebody will be there in the morning, that someone cares out there in the world that they've experienced. And I think we all realized together, I certainly did, 
that these pajamas were not about the material or the cloth. It was about what it represented to these to these children. Yeah, you know, pajamas, you know, I know of our kids, you know, that's part of the bedtime ritual, right? Right. When we say it's time to get in your pajamas, that's starting Mm -hmm. to like, it's time to start unwinding your mind, get a bath and um, (laughs) really to start to end the day, right? So we can start a new tomorrow. Yes, that's the pajama program's tagline. Yes, good nights or good days. Yes, exactly. And tomorrow brings a new day and a new opportunity, which is really important to kids to be able to wind down. So that can be very, very important. And I love it how you know, your work has done 7 million pajamas and books, you know, that's, <laughs> Takes that's, a lot of people. <laughs> that's a lot of, that's a lot of kids that got some pajamas and some good night rest. So that's really, really good. Now you are an author of a best-selling book and that book is right behind you. Purpose, passion, and pajamas. Tell us about this book and why you chose to write that. Over the 20 years, as in the subtitle, it transformed my life, but I saw it transform volunteers and you know who we call our chapter presidents around the US because purpose changes everything. It gives you a connection to the greater good, to strangers through a story, through a heartfelt connection. And it's it's purpose. And it's it can be tiny or it can be huge or it can start as tiny and just grow into this movement. But it it leaves a lasting impression on not only those you help, of Of course, the children came first and loving them, even from afar, was our reason for being. But it bonded so many and still bonds so many of us who found some something in common about the need to just help provide this small item to these children. And it's something I've talked about and over the years mentored and now coach. And I wanted to write this book to share more about a simple act of listening to your heart, of taking the time to bring what's on that back burner forward. It changes your life and everyone's life in your life. I love that. So tell me about why do people not listen to their calling? Is it that some people don't hear their calling, find their calling? you know, and maybe that's a reality. They don't know their calling, right? Tell me about like the calling and those that are looking for it or tell me about that whole process of the calling. Sure, sure. I used to think that this purpose thing was for, you know, the, the greats of the world, the Einsteins, you know, even Deepak Chopra and Oprah and people, you know, who were, who were doing these amazing, amazing life-changing things and they were brave and they had some something, some gift that none of us had, the rest of us had. But I've learned that we all do. And sometimes it finds you, you know, it found me in that little girl's question. And I think for a lot of us, it's there. We feel it. We know it. It's in the back of our minds because we're afraid that if it's something we haven't been schooled in or educated in or know much about, we'd never make it. And we'd be a fool to even voice that we wanted to do this. I think a lot of us have come far in a career, maybe a traditional one, or followed a path that was set for us. And we immediately think it's too late. You know, that was a dream, but it, it's never going to happen. I, I'm not going to start now at 30, 40, 50, 60. It's all crazy because I started late too. I was 12, 13 years into a corporate career and I became obsessed. And, and one of the good things about obsession is, is that it's a motivator uh, for us to do some action. But I think especially during these 18 months, so many of us were in a place of reflection, you know, and, and fear. And if this is our chance to rethink where we want our life to go, what direction and how we want to contribute, I think people are feeling those nudges and they're coming to grips with the fact that they might be on a path that they'd like to switch and they don't know how to do it. You know, that's an interesting conversation. I know that a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, when they think about their passion, right? Just like you said, it's usually not related to the current line of work that they're doing, right? It's usually not related. And and for a lot of them, it's going to be a complete 360, right? Or maybe instead of 360 and 90, right? Because that way you don't come back to the beginning, um, the great angle or turn. And so I'm wondering, like, a lot of times when I talk to entrepreneurs, when they think about pursuing their passion, right? And we're a profit talk, right? We're the profit talk. We're a profit first channel. So we're going to get down to profits and passion, right? 
And they have a hard time connecting the idea of a calling with the potential to earn or even feeling that they're worthy to earn if they follow their passion. So tell me about that journey of, you know, having to make a living, right? Having to earn profit, but at the same time, wanting to do good. Tell me about what that experience has been for you and how our entrepreneurs should tackle that. Um, Yes, I certainly know the ups and downs and and all of the downs. And my book is very honest. You know, I was not prepared. I never thought that I was going to switch careers, never mind to start a nonprofit from the ground up. I didn't know how to do that. I knew nothing about it. I didn't even know what I was doing was going to be more than volunteering, but that obsession took over and I wasn't financially prepared. And I, you know, I did push myself a little too much and charge too many credit cards because I just couldn't imagine arriving at a shelter and not having enough. And I couldn't not answer the phone from other people from other shelters saying, I heard you have pajamas. Can you come? I'd always say yes. So there are ways to do it. And over these 20 years, I've been coaching. And certainly there's the way to plan the switch. And I call that the jump. And then I teach the slide. So I teach it's a slide or it's a jump. It doesn't have to be one or the other or both, but a slide will change your life because if you slide whatever it is that is your your purpose or your passion into your life and keep your job, you will notice a major change. If you spend, and I do a whole curriculum, if you spend an hour, even once a week, immersed in whatever your secret purpose or that nudging passion is, you will be amazed at how it fills you and makes you feel so much richer about your life and not denying that part of you, which is, is so, so dangerous to do. It just is so, it's sad, among other things, to keep pushing back whatever you want to do. So if you want to sing, if you want to raise horses, if you want to work in a shelter, there are ways that you don't have to disrupt your entire life and everyone else's life in it by a slide. And then if you're ready at time and in, in time to make that jump, you can. And if you are like me and you just jump and figure out how to swim in the water, then, you know, then there are many of us, I know I speak for many of us who can share our stories and want to share our stories and offer our support because for some of us, that's the way we know. Definitely. And, you know, even as an entrepreneur, right, or even as and seeking your calling doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't make profit from it, right? It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to make a living from doing what you you love doing. And so, you know, implementing profit first, so, you know, even in the midst of doing what you love, you know, it's it's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, and it's, again, being intentional about the purpose, but at the same time, being intentional about the outcome and the profits too, with it yes, also I, is I've very seen, important. Yep. I mean, I did it. Um, I've seen many people do it from an idea that at first glance, you'd think, how could you ever make money doing that? But if you take a look at all the people around, you'd see the most beautiful purposes profitable. And it's just, you know, part of it is focus and mindset. Part of it's a plan. Part of it's believing yourself. Part of it, a big part of it is sharing that purpose because there's this invisible human connection. You know, and if there's one lesson at the end of every chapter in my book, which is a, the how and why of pajama program and my finding purpose and how you can, there are heart of the matter lessons. And the sharing part is, is huge to give it voice and to connect with people. And I've learned that even though I thought as many of us do that, look at one person, the power of one, one person can do, can change the world. In reality, I found out it's not the power of one that changes things. It's the power of one another that moves mountains and moves people. And that's a key. I love that. The power of one another, right? It's not just one that's going to accomplish 7 million pajamas. It's the power of each other, right? Yeah. And working together. You know, um, I want to ask one of the things that our entrepreneurs, um, one of the challenges that we face, especially as scaling entrepreneurs, where we're, we're no longer a team of one, we've got a team behind us, right? Is sometimes, you know, we outgrow the people that we're with, right? Sometimes the, whoever started with us on our team may not be the one that takes us to the next level. And sometimes the reason why is, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's not that team member's calling, right? It's not the thing that they were meant to do. And maybe they don't quite realize it, but, you know, we realize it because they're just not able to keep up. 
Um, they're a little bit sluggish or not excited about taking on new opportunities. And, you know, I know that you're a coach, you're a leadership strategist. Also, you teach leadership lessons. How do we transition in that moment where, you know, our staff, you know, really aren't in their zone of genius anymore? They're really not doing what they're meant to do. How do you coach someone that is in that situation to have them start to explore or maybe even leave, right? In order to find themselves and find their own calling. Um, are you asking me as a coach for this person or as a leader with this person on my team? As a leader. I've been in, in, in those shoes. And especially now, I think it's really important. I think you can you can break your team into two or three categories. They're the ones who believe and understand your purpose that you've shared with them, that they understand and they're all in because what they're doing is contributing to something bigger than a paycheck, bigger than their job. It's somehow contributing to others the lives of other people and making it better, even maybe contributing to the greater good. So those people are a great asset because their heart is in it. For those who are came on board for a job and you know and are doing the job, I think it's really a responsibility for leaders to understand that it might not be that person's perfect you know, calling, that there's a conversation to be had and support to be given because as a leader you want everyone to feel committed and really enjoy coming to work and being part of the greater good not just the bottom line so if there's comfort and awareness between a leader and someone who may or may not be all in i think that that person deserves a voice and if if they need support because they really want to do something else and they're afraid or they feel like they've invested why change I think as a leader, that the best thing we can do is support them in their own dream and let them and let them go and find it. It's just bigger than the company that, you know, they, they are part of. It's part of the, the greater, the universal good that we offer each other. So I think those who are, are all in continue to make them feel responsible for doing what they love right there and contributing. And those who are not Give them that support and let them dream. Just like the entrepreneurs, just like we had that dream. Who knows better than us what that what that can turn into? You know, it's an interesting conversation um, with that. You know, at some point, you know, they're like, your body's here, but your mind isn't, right? Mm -hmm. Do you believe in just letting them go? And, you know, some of us might do severance pay or that type of thing. And or do you feel like you let them stay on even though they're not really into it until they find themselves? Because, you know, some people can take years or a lifetime to find yourself. What is your thoughts on that? Every situation is personal. Every situation is different. But I think a frank conversation and I think after this pandemic, there are more frank conversations and more heartfelt and more interest from management. Um, hopefully there is. It seems to be going in that direction. And I think everyone has been through different circumstances in the last not only 18 months, but in their lives. So you have to find out what's this person about today? What's important today? Is there something that's missing that we can offer here to make it make it much better for them? Is it something totally different that they want to be doing? So there's not one answer, but I think if there's a conversation, then what's right to do will will appear and the leader will know, is it worth holding on to this person? Is it worth making some changes because that's all they need to feel like they are part of our team? You know, it can be something that's simpler and it can be something that is just not going to fix things or not going to make it a real cohesive relationship. And then I think each circumstance, each person is a separate conversation of how to proceed. But, you know, keeping that support there, I think is really key to an honest relationship, which I think we all need now. So going back to purpose, passion, and pajamas. So, you know, when that, when that itch starts to happen, when that calling starts to get whispered to you, what are the first steps that you should take in order to explore that and um, get onto your, your mission in life? Mm, well, um, I think when we realize that we know it's going, we're going to allow it to take over more of our life, I think we need to enjoy that feeling because I think too many of us rush 
past it and think, okay, down to, you know, brass tax, what do I have to do? I have to get a plan. I have to get a budget. I have to do all this stuff. And you, we do. But I think if we let our minds dream and create, you know, I create vision boards with people, create a, a picture on our mind and a story of how we want this to go in a creative way, give ourselves that joy, that just that exhilaration. It's a big deal. It's a big deal when each of us decides we're going to honor our purpose, whether it's a slide into our life on the side or we're jumping in, whether we've planned it for 10 years or this 18 months has just said, do it, make the change. I think we need to really relish that because that's what's going to get us through the difficult nights, the, the nights of tossing and turning and the fear and the doubt, which is you know, bound to happen. And certainly for me, it happened <laughs> a lot. And I think we need to really enjoy that. And I'm a big paper to pen person. So I wrote down all my goals, you know, all my, all my dreams for just a short amount of time, the first three months. It's a short enough time. I tell people when I coach them that you can really achieve them and keep that joy. You're not looking at, oh, a year from now, I have to raise, you know, half a million dollars. In the first three months, it's part of the excitement planning. So I think that enjoying it, taking time to really hand write what your dreams are will fuel the rest that's to come. I love that, Jeremy. You know, I think so many times, you know, as people, right, we like to rush to that next step. You know, when we were young, it's going to graduate from high school. When you get into college, I want to get out of college, you know, when you're single, I want to get married. When you're married, you want to get children. And then you want them to grow up, right? The only thing we don't rush for is dying, right? And the problem that we have in life is when we're rushing from one step to another is we don't appreciate the moments as they're happening, right? We don't appreciate that moment that, you know, where you know, when you get to sit in your room and you're all by yourself and you have no kids and no spouse around, yeah. right? And the same with businesses or even new ventures or new callings, right? You enjoy that moment of, mm-hmm. wow, this is what I'm meant to do. And let me yeah. just savor each step. Savor that first collection of pajamas, right? And that first person that you hand those pajamas to. So to savor those moments, that is really, really great advice. Now, one of the things I like to ask all of our guests is if you could leave our viewers and our listeners with one piece of advice, it could be personal, it can be business. What would that piece of advice be? I think entrepreneurs who've been very successful, I think that it's our responsibility to share what we know, what we've seen, who we know, the support and the encouragement and the tricks to you know, getting fear out of the way and to make that next step when it's um, a really dark tunnel or it looks like it's a really dark tunnel. And I think these days, it's really, really more important because there are so many more people out there who want to go for their dream and don't want to say out loud, don't want to share it, are afraid for obvious reasons. And I really think it's our responsibility to share what we know, to coach, to mentor, to be open and honest, to invite them, to pick our brains and brainstorm. Every time I coach someone, I learn so much more. It's just such a great two-way street. Definitely. It's great to be around those that are moving in the same direction. And you know, one of the things that people struggle with is just sharing the dream, right? Um, you know, even with close folks like your spouse, you know, like we were afraid to, to share the dream because of the criticism, right? Because your spouse may not share that same dream or maybe that dream puts them in a uncomfortable situation where they are now having risk, right? In terms of being right. able to support the family um, financially because there is a ramp up period with the business or even having to make contributions. How do you deal with sharing the dream? Yes, that is a big concern for a lot of people, it's more of a concern for those of us like me <laughs> who decided in one day that I was obsessed with this notion and who, you know, bull in China shop just went for it. And I know I'm not alone. That's the trickier situation, depending on who you depend on and who depends on you. So I do teach a step back because I've learned the hard way that there's a right way to share and to prepare for that conversation. And, um, you know, and, and other ways that aren't as, um, as, as honest. So I think that 
the certainly the earlier you start to feel this little nudge that you voice, the better. And I think obviously knowing who you're talking to and knowing where they may come from all plays into the kind of conversation you have to have. But I, I, I am, talk to people all the time and there's always a way to bring that purpose to light for you always. And it doesn't mean jumping is the right way. I love that. So just using the sermon also too, because you know each person you're going to have to treat differently based on yeah. what they can handle um, with your dream. So Genevieve, how does our audience, our listeners, our viewers connect with you to learn more about your work, to learn more about how to find their calling and how to implement that? Sure. I, I'd love to to talk to anybody who wants to brainstorm or, or talk about anything. And everything is on GenevievePituro.com, my website. Um, and I'm on all social media. So anything that you want to reach me about, you can find on my website, the summit, the book, the coaching, or just a question. So it's GenevieveFituro.com. I love that. Now, Genevieve has a very complicated name. So I'm going to put her <laughs> website in our show notes so that you guys can connect with her and find out about her conference, her book, in order to learn more about her and connect with her to find your calling. So thank you, Genevieve, for joining us today and sharing purpose, passion, and pajamas with us. Thank you for having me.